What did Elon Musk and the board of directors actually pitch to shareholders? Why would they agree to this? Were Tesla shareholders misled somehow? 55 billion is an insane number. I mean, just when I heard the number alone, I was like, okay, that's ridiculous. If I was a Tesla shareholder, I'd be pissed. Then I read that 73% of Tesla shareholders voted in favor of the pay package. I'm gonna be missing something. Surely there is some more context here that the headlines are not giving me. Let me read this excerpt from Tesla's statement to shareholders on the specifics of Elon Musk's new pay package. Elon will receive no guaranteed compensation of any kind, no salary, no cash bonuses, and no equity that vests by the passage of time. Instead, Elon's only compensation will be 100% at-risk performance award. So if Elon doesn't perform, he gets nothing. The award consists of stock options that vest only if Tesla achieves specific milestones, which if fully achieved would make Tesla one of the most valuable companies in the world, okay? With a market capitalization of at least 650 billion, more than 10 times today's value. Interesting, okay, so Elon doesn't get paid at all if he doesn't hit the milestones. Of course, we are looking at this now in hindsight, so maybe that's a little bit unfair because he has reached all the milestones. Elon Musk points out here that if he only is able to increase Tesla's market cap by 80 or 90%, then he would receive nothing. So there is quite a bit of risk here in accepting this payment plan. In the statement to shareholders, this graph gives a little bit more perspective on why Tesla shareholders were warm to the new performance plan pay package. In 2012, Elon had a similar plan where he had to perform or else he would get no payment at all. You can see in 2012, Tesla was 3.9 billion, and by 2017, Elon had more than 17 x Tesla's market cap. To be fair, that is a huge profit for shareholders. Of course, the directors attribute this huge success to the performance payment plan at the time. Elon was able to create huge value for shareholders before, maybe he could do it again. Anyway, let's dig a little bit deeper and see exactly what Elon's pay package was all about. This chart here compares his 2012 pay package to his new 2018 pay package. So percent compensation at risk, we already covered this, 100% both before and now, meaning if Elon doesn't hit that first milestone, then he's gonna get nothing over the 10 year period. The second row just shows the market capitalization of Tesla at the time. That just means what is Tesla worth? The third column, a percent outstanding shares vested per tranche. The tranche is just the milestone that he hits. This is what percentage of Tesla's outstanding shares is Elon able to purchase at a good price, and I'll get into that later. This is his reward for hitting each milestone. The fourth row is market capitalization increment per tranche. For 2018, he has to increase it by 50 billion. So that first reward is gonna be 100 billion. The third reward would be at $150 billion net worth, all the way up to $650 billion worth of Tesla. When the 2018 plan was drafted, Tesla's market price at that time was about 50 billion. So Elon's logic is if I double the share price, I get a reward. If I triple the share price, I get a reward and so on. This payment plan is so much bigger than the previous one because he's getting 1% of Tesla shares every time instead of just half a percent. Now, what exactly does it mean when I say Elon gets 1% of Tesla shares? In reality, what he's getting is an option to purchase shares at a favorable price. In this case, the strike price of his option, this is the price that he gets to buy the shares at, is the share price in January of 2018. So at the time, it was, the share price of Tesla was 350. If he's able to double the share price and get the share price to $700, he has the option to buy it at $350 which is a profit of $350 per share. And that's 1% of Tesla. So every time he doubles that strike price, he's able to get a better and better deal on more and more shares of Tesla. Now, when Elon executes these options and buys the shares at the better price, it's important to remember that he's not buying shares from other shareholders. Tesla is actually issuing more shares, which actually has a diluting effect on Tesla's shareholders. What do you mean by dilution? If I have a slice of pizza and I promise you, I'm gonna give you one slice of pizza and I'm gonna have one slice of pizza. If we split this pizza 50-50, but if I go behind your back and I promise my neighbor that I'll also give him a slice of pizza and my neighbor's friend, oh, he wants a slice, so I'm gonna give him a slice too. And you're still getting your one slice of pizza, but now it's only worth a quarter of the whole pie. And you've been diluted because I have issued more slices of pizza. It's the same with Tesla. Now, Elon is buying those shares, so he is injecting more cash into Tesla, but he's buying those shares at the reduced share price. He's not putting the full worth of those shares back into Tesla, 
So there is definitely a diluting effect, which is bad for shareholders. So now I better understand the cost to the shareholders. And I also understand the benefit. If Elon doesn't perform, he doesn't get paid. If he performs really, really well, he gets paid a whole lot. So I mean, Elon's providing a lot of value to shareholders and the shareholders are getting a little bit diluted, yes, but Elon created all of this value. Why should they be so upset about a little bit of dilution? And Tesla shareholders clearly agreed. 73% voted in favor of this pay package. The last thing I wanna look at before moving on to the court's opinion and why the court thought that Elon should lose all that pay I wanna look at what other car companies did during that same time period. This video by Ranking Charts gives us a visual of the 20 years following 2001 of the top 10 car manufacturers in the world. In the first 10 year period from 2001 to 2011, only Volkswagen succeeded in more than 2Xing its market capitalization. If all of these CEOs from these top 10 car manufacturers in the world, if they had Elon Musk's same performance package, none of them would have got paid between 2001 and 2011. And then as I let the video play past 2011, you can see how much Tesla absolutely popped off. Starting in 2018 specifically, when Tesla shareholders agreed to his performance plan, the market cap of Tesla exploded, dwarfing all of the other car manufacturers. I mean, that's kind of hard to argue with. I'm really curious now to see what does the court say? How could they possibly justify taking away Elon's compensation after doing that. Let's read directly from the Delaware court's opinion. Was the richest person in the world overpaid? With a $55.8 billion maximum value, the plan is the largest potential compensation opportunity ever observed in a public company by multiples of order of magnitude. 250 times larger than the contemporaneous median peer compensation and over 33 times larger than the plan's closest comparison, which was Musk's prior compensation plan. This post-trial decision enters judgment for the plaintiff, finding the compensation plan is subject to review under the entire fairness standard. This means that Elon Musk and the Tesla's board of directors are effectively now guilty until proven innocent instead of the other way around. They must prove now beyond a doubt that the pay package is fair instead of the plaintiff or the accuser proving that the pay package is unfair. Normally for a disputed business transaction, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff or the accuser. This is called the business judgment rule. This rule only applies when at least one side of the transaction is both independent and disinterested. Remember, Elon Musk is on one side of the transaction. He's receiving the pay, so he is definitely interested. So we're gonna be focusing on the other side. We have to prove, or Elon Musk has to prove, that the compensation committee is both independent of Elon and disinterested in Elon's payment. And it does make sense that you would have a higher standard of proof in situations like this. I mean, this is a major red flag. Whenever one side has the ability to control the other side, or if both sides can be proven to be somehow interested in the outcome, yeah, you wanna have a higher standard of proof. You have to prove that this transaction was fair because of the existence of the red flag. Now, remember, just because there is a red flag, it doesn't mean that something did go wrong. You just have to prove now that something didn't go wrong. So the question is, are both parties interested? In this case, the court has determined that Elon is a controlling shareholder. A controlling shareholder is somebody who has enough control over Tesla, which means they have enough control over the board of directors and the compensation committee, such that Elon could essentially be setting his own salary to some extent. This means that both sides of the transaction are not independent. Now my question is, why does the court say that Elon is a controlling shareholder? Especially when Elon doesn't control 51% of Tesla shares. He only owns 21.9% of Tesla be precise. Does Musk control Tesla? Delaware courts have been presented with this question thrice before, and essentially in other cases, they decided to dodge the question. But this court will go boldly where no man has gone before. Yeah, they had to throw in the Star Trek reference, very good. So in addition to his 21.9% equity stake, Musk was the paradigmatic superstar CEO who held some of the most influential corporate positions, CEO, chair, and founder. He enjoyed thick ties with the directors, tasked with negotiating on behalf of Tesla, and he dominated the process that led to the board approval of his compensation plan. At least to this transaction, Musk controlled Tesla. So the court has made their case. Was Musk a superstar CEO? Yeah, I think I can see it. Was he a big time shareholder? No, 
uh, nearly 22%. Yeah, that's a big time shareholder. But did he really have thick ties with the directors of the board and the members of the compensation committee? Real quick guys, thanks for watching. And if you've made it this far, please do me this one simple favor and hit the like button. In return, I'll do my best to create better and better content like this. Back to the video. The first committee member is a rim priest. I hope I'm saying that right. They have invested tens of millions of dollars in Musk controlled companies. They've been a member of the board since 2007. And then between 2011 and 2015, they made $200 million from options granted by Tesla. Tesla is controlled by Elon. So this is essentially, he got paid $200 million by Elon. The second committee member is Bus. A little easier of a name to say. This person served as the Solar City CFO under Elon Musk. He was compensated 17 million as a Tesla director and realized 24 million selling shares that he received as compensation from Tesla. That's Musk basically. Bus owed roughly 44% of his net worth to Musk entities. Okay, that's a strong connection. Third, we have Den Holm. Den Holm joined the board in 2014. She received the vast majority of her wealth from Tesla as a director. She ultimately received $280 million through sales of just some of the Tesla options that she received as part of her director compensation. She described this as life-changing. Okay. Fourth, we have Gracias, who joined the board in 2007. As of 2017, Gracias was the third largest individual investor in Tesla. As of 2021, that Tesla stock was worth approximately $1 billion. All told, Gracias and his fund have netted billions of dollars by investing in Musk companies, many of which were made only with Musk's personal invitation. Another strong connection. Fifth, Murdoch, who goes on family vacations with Musk and is heavily invested in Musk-controlled entities, tens of millions in SpaceX, which would require invitation to invest since it is a privately owned company. Once again, thick ties. Finally, we have Rice, who does not seem to have a super strong connection with Musk, but this would be the only member on the committee who is not strongly tied both monetarily and with personal ties to Musk. So it looks like the vast majority of the compensation committee owes a huge portion of their net worth to either Tesla, who we have confirmed Musk effectively controls, or they owe it to Elon Musk himself. Effectively, it seems like Elon Musk was negotiating the terms of his compensation with himself. So now you might be asking, Brian, why do I care about all this? Why do I care about Elon's relationship with the committee when they spelled out the details of the compensation package and they let the shareholders vote on it? and they overwhelmingly voted for it, 73%. Before I show you the court's argument for why the directors and the compensation committee failed in their fiduciary responsibility, I want you to consider a situation where you're buying a house. You have hired a real estate agent, and that real estate agent has a fiduciary responsibility to you. You found your dream house, you show your agent, and you say, I gotta have it. This is the house, this is the one. So your real estate agent says, all right, based on my expertise, based on the current market conditions, and all the time I spent researching this house, it is my professional opinion that you need to offer $50,000 over asking or you're not gonna get this house. In your mind, you're like, okay, I trust this person. This person has a fiduciary responsibility to me. They're acting in my best interest. I gotta have this house. So just like the Tesla shareholders who knew what they were getting, like you knew you were getting this house, they knew the cost of their CEO and they voted that they want. Would your opinion change if you found out that your real estate agent was heavily connected to the homeowners of the house that you're trying to buy. Then you find out that the homeowners, they were actually the ones that pitched the $50,000 over asking and your real estate agent just went along with it. This is kind of similar to what happened with Tesla. The board of directors and the compensation committee have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. So what does fiduciary responsibility mean? According to Harvard Business School, fiduciary duties to investors include four aspects duty of obedience, information, loyalty, and care. I want to draw attention to two of these. First, information. This requires candor, the obligation to be open and honest with shareholders. The board did not properly disclose to shareholders how this compensation package came into being. The second factor I wanna look at is loyalty. Loyalty requires acting in the shareholder's best interests ahead of your own best interests. And the board did not do this. So how does the court prove these two claims? The first claim being that the board of directors and the compensation committee did not properly describe how the details of the compensation plan were created. 
In crafting this award, we were mindful of Elon's existing stock ownership levels and the strong belief that the best outcome for our stockholders is for Elon to continue leading the company. We created the award after more than six months of careful analysis with a leading independent compensation consultant, as well as discussions with Elon. So they kind of downplay the discussions with Elon and they say that we created this after months of careful planning. We recommend that you vote for the proposed CEO Performance Award. Discussing with Elon his compensation is necessarily a bad thing. And they should both be advocating for their respective sides. Elon should be advocating for himself and the compensation committee should be advocating for the shareholder's best interest. At this point, you would expect to see some pushback from the board of directors or the compensation committee. In reality, the only change that the compensation committee came up with was the operational milestones to go along with Elon's market cap milestones, and they did not try to lower his compensation from 1% back down to half a percent or anything like that. The reality of the situation was that Elon Musk was the one who was calibrating his own deal. It really wasn't the compensation committee that was pushing back, it was Elon. There were three separate times that he tried to change the compensation to lower it, to make it a little bit more reasonable. That should have came from the compensation committee. The only things that the compensation committee did during the negotiations was one, they added the operational milestones to go along with the market cap milestones. And that was a feature that also appeared in the 2012 grant. So as long as Elon is producing organic growth, it's really not that much more difficult. And then the second thing they did was in the very end, they pushed Elon from 10 tranches of fully diluted shares to 12 tranches of non-diluted shares. It did technically make it a little bit more difficult on Elon because he would have to hit 12 milestones instead of 10, but the compensation would be exactly the same. When you look at the actual evolution of the compensation plan, it really paints a much different picture than what the letter to shareholders described. And this is the key point. This is one of the key points how the judge says that the board of directors and the compensation committee were not fully transparent with shareholders and thus they failed in one of their fiduciary responsibilities. The second aspect of the fiduciary responsibility that the board of directors and compensation committee failed on was loyalty. They weren't acting in their shareholders best interest. If they were, then they would have come up with some plan, any plan that would have resulted in keeping Elon Musk for less pay. There is no way that 1% of Tesla for each tranche was the minimum that Elon was willing to stay on board for. The fact that they did not push back at all in reducing that compensation just highlights the fact that they were more interested in appeasing Elon than they were creating the most value for the Tesla shareholders. A perfect way to illustrate this is comparing it to their 2012 plan. In 2012, Tesla's market cap was 17 times less than it was in 2018 when they put the new compensation plan into effect and the rewards were half as much. Half a percent of three billion versus a full percent of 50 billion, and that's a huge difference. They should have been at least pushing for a similar compensation plan that Elon got in 2012. The whole process seemed to be set by Elon Musk for Elon Musk. Now, I will be the first to admit that you know, Elon Musk has absolutely killed it with Tesla as far as creating value for his shareholders. And I absolutely want Elon Musk at the helm. If I was a Tesla shareholder, I would want absolutely for Elon to be the CEO. But that does not mean that I want to pay any arbitrary amount to keep him there. In my opinion, the court was right to overturn this ridiculous payment package, but they should have done it like five years ago when it was first put into place. It is a little bit crappy to wait until he hits all the milestones and then say, ah, you know what, I do feel for Elon and NASA. And if you disagree with that, then catch me outside. How about that? Catch me outside, how about that? Catch you outside? Seriously though, you can catch me in the comments. If you are a Tesla shareholder, I wanna know, what's your opinion? Do you think this pay package was worth it to just ensure that you're keeping Elon as the CEO? Or did you wanna see the compensation committee talk him down a little bit, at least negotiate a little bit, get him down to half a percent per tranche. On the other hand, if you are not a Tesla shareholder, but you are looking for the next big investment, there are some exciting developments in the cannabis sector. Check out this video where I go over the latest leaks regarding rescheduling cannabis to schedule three if this goes through, we could see some huge movement in cannabis stocks in the short term. Catch you on the flip side.